Steve said, my name is Roger Roach. I'm with APA, um, also presenting on the 2012 IRC wall bracing provisions, specifically the seismic provisions today. Uh, Bob, for those of you that have been on, Bob has already noted this, but if there's anybody new, just to remind everyone that we're a nonprofit trade association. We re represent um, the manufacturers of engineered wood products, whether it be structural wood panels, blue lamb, eye joist, anything that's pretty much cut and re-glued uh, falls under the APA. Uh, the presentations, the first three you've already heard with Bob, the fourth one is going to be me today under seismic related provisions, and the fifth one will be um, high wind resistance, which will be Brian Redling, and he'll be uh, on October 16th. Uh, 2014 at 3 o'clock again on uh, Eastern Standard, Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, my phone number, cell number is uh, on there and my email is there and it will appear again at the end of the presentation. Performance Walls has been brought up a number of times where we're housing these uh, presentations. And the Help Desk, I'm sure Bob brought up, but they're a great resource for everybody. Um, they're always present where sometimes we're on the road and can't quite get to the phone in time and uh, they're a great resource and, and full of knowledge over there. Beyond that, APA's website, I'm sure everybody, I hope everybody's seen that. Tons of information there on our website for the selection and specification and use of material. Uh, today again, uh, our presentations are, are based on the uh, 2012 IRC Part of that is the uh, pr uh, Wall Bracing Provisions Guide of the 2012 IRC, which is uh, published by the ICC. You see their item number there. That's for sale by them. And there's things that you uh, wish you could have retained or don't remember from the presentation and want some more detail, potentially. Um, this is a great uh, uh, tool to use, and it's, again, for sale by the ICC. The one on the right is probably a little bit more basic for some of you, but if you're trying to explain uh, what wall bracing is about and um, somebody doesn't quite understand the, the bracing rules and the code and why it's so complicated, that's a great tool to use there, and that's provided by APA. All of our publications are free PDF downloads, and so you can get that from uh, the APA website. I'm going to cover some areas very similar to what Bob did as far as the categories go, but just trying to interject only the uh, elements that have to do with the higher seismic. First with the lateral loads, uh, Bob covered the wind uh, uh, where we deal mostly with forces uh, against the, the sail, the wall, the, the roof, the things that catch the wind, and that pressure equals some sort of force, and, and we deal with that in the IRC. Seismic is a little bit different in that we've got this, uh, just this, this, this lump of stuff, which happens to be a house with a lot of weight or it's got a mass to it, and we try to pull the rug out from underneath it. The ground wants to move around, and, and so the structure kind of bounces around, and, and the force is slightly different, but really the resistance or the way we deal with it in the code is very similar. We have different rules around that to make sure that we have sufficient bracing, but uh, the resistance side is pretty similar. And we want to always try to stop this racking, the, the parallelogram, the out of square motion that the, that the uh, structure goes through during a loaded event. If we do that right, then we want to make sure it stays where we built it, in the ground, somewhere on that foundation. And to try to keep it from slipping off those foundations, we uh, have anchor bolts for that, and, and then if we do that right, the last sort of force that we might need to worry about is overturning, so we have to restrain or hold that building down, and do that more or less with hold downs. Very limited amount in the IRT, that is. 
The racking, this is a great shot. It's an old shot of a seismic event in California, but it shows us that, you know, we, we need to understand what bracing is. We know what brace panels are, but if we don't connect them well enough to the framing, the studs, then we still end up, or we don't have enough in this case, we still end up with issues, and it's a great shot of what that parallelogram would look like. The anchor bolts that we talked about, uh, the one thing I wanted to mention with these is that we do have those strap versions that uh, are available from you know, different manufacturers, but also Bob probably mentioned, or he did mention uh, in one of his presentations, when we have that issue of needing a hold down um, where we have brace wall panels starting away from a corner, we'll get into that later today again, but it's a little bit different for seismic. Well, when Bob talked about that, if you remember, he told you we needed an 800-pound hold down. There are some of these anchors that uh, actually fasten into the stud, too, not just into the plate like you see on the one on the left. And those, some of those actually carry a load just over 800 pounds, and those would be sufficient for that hold down. So we don't have to get into this big, grand, robust thing that we see on the right side of the screen where... Uh, uh, it's a true hold down used for shear walls or uplift resistance or something like that. So let's get into that earthquake loading. What is that thing? And everybody knows that uh, you go to the tables and we look at a map and the darker it gets, the worse it get, the worse it gets. And we have to um, figure out where we're at as far as uh, seismic design categories in the U.S. and and then the code tells us that we do some things to, to uh, uh, adhere to those extra loads. We understand this vertical gravity. I know uh, uh, Bob talked about this, and it's sort of, you know, like standing on a pop can or something, and we squish it down, and we know where those loads go on a house. It goes through the framing members uh, that keep uh, uh, working their way down to the ground, into the footing. And if everything's done right, the building stays where it's supposed to, and, and we understand these loads pretty well. Uh, I know Bob showed this, but I want to show it again one more time because when we, if we were to kind of flip that building on its side and stick it on a cliff, it's a little easier to see the magic where engineers do all their work because this is where they get paid because um, the understanding of where the loads uh, uh, are transferred through the structure a little bit more difficult to see this way in this direction how those loads work and keep the building square keep it from sliding off that cliff and then keep it from overturning so uh, this is you know where the engineers really make their money and 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 use their service for an understanding of that and, and that band of uh, folks that were in the IRC ad hoc committee they spend a lot of time understanding these loads to become to help come up with prescriptive ways that we can continue to move on with structures in the IRC wall bracing. And that's done through uh, the loads have to go through the wall section somehow into corners and where we have connections into roofs or floors or into the walls so that we can transfer that load into the side walls and get it down into the foundation and do its job. I know Bob covered this too. Just remember prescriptive. We have a lot of limitations we work around or boundaries that we work around. And most of the time doesn't hand doesn't deal with hold downs in the prescriptive paths. There are a couple of items that, that were showed that we use hold downs in, but for the most part not. And we're shear walls in the IBC, the, the engineers can do pretty much anything they want. Well in the IRC if we have that problem where we uh, fall outside of the IRC, we can always go to the section R301 there and, and uh, design the piece or portion that falls outside of compliance of the IRC. Looking at the limits, uh, again, the, 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 the line where we draw between prescriptive uh, falling in the wind and or seismic is townhome C and detached to uh, one or two family dwelling D. So if you've got a C townhome or a D uh, uh, single family, we have to use both tables then. We can't just use the wind tables. We have to jump into the seismic also. 
what does that look like? Well, we all know what a single family looks like on the left there, and, and so it wouldn't apply in design category C. Where is that townhome on the right? So the definition of that really it more probably applies to the fire than it does structure, but it gets sort of lumped in together. And essentially, the difference is, is that the townhome, we need to have at least two open, two, uh, open egress areas on uh, each side of the structure. If not, then we get into, I guess, what we call an apartment. Weights become important. Remember that, that, that lump of stuff, a lot of weight sitting there, that thing sitting on the foundation. It becomes important. So as opposed to wind where you might have brick or something where you've got a, a lot of extra weight on the structure, in many cases that can be helpful in wind. But uh, um, dealing with the, the seismic considerations, we have some boundaries or parameters we have to deal with, and uh, those are listed here, and then we'll get into to the detail of those later on. Um, snow loads don't change. We're at 70 pounds uh, per square foot or less for prescriptive. The one big topic, if you will, or item for the seismic is their irregular building. So what that is, is in Chapter 3, there's um, irregularities that are considered inside on a building or a structure that tell us uh, whether we need to have further consideration, if you will, on what, what we can do in our design to stay prescriptive in the IRC. There's seven of those, and once we fall into one of those seven, then we have to jump over here to um, the additional rules that tell us, all right, you're in uh, an irregularity. Now, if you can meet these other rules, you can stay in the IRC and move forward. There's a couple there that you see, four and six, that there is no get out of jail card. We're stuck with um, um, going to engineering in that case. But other than that, there are ways that we can um, stay within IRC, and if we do fall outside of the IRC, then, then we need to jump to engineering. So I'm going to go through, just show what those irregularities are, and we'll go through them in detail. So the first one is setbacks and cantilevers. Number two is unsupported floors and roofs. Actually, I should say laterally unsupported floors and roofs. We're not talking about the uh, vertical loads in this case. Panel window location. So if you've got a braced wall panel on a second floor or a store above, story above, we need to make sure that we follow some rules as to where that lands on the opening below. The first one that if we fall outside in this case is number four. That's the opening in the floor or roof for like a stairwell. Um, if, if, if we fall outside there, we go straight to engineering. There are some uh, limitations, though, on what we're allowed to have on that. The uh, vertical floor offsets uh, we'll get into. I don't see those too much right now, but, but they're still in there. The sixth one, which is the second one that falls right into engineering, is the non-perpendicular wall. So if we don't have these right-angle buildings or right-angle walls, then we have to jump into um, engineering, and that's another one of the no-goes. And the last one, number seven, is uh, brick or masonry uh, construction above ground, where essentially uh, where there's a lot of limitations there on what we can do, uh, and, and, we're, and we're very limited to how much weight we can add to those walls. All right, that first one was uh, vertical in plane. Um, if that falls outside of being vertically in plane, uh, there's some then rules that we have to adhere to. So the first one says of those rules, we need to have at least two by ten joists or whatever the I joist equivalent would be, and we have to have a maximum of 16 inch spacing between those joists. So obviously, if we're hanging out with a cantilever or on, on a back set, we need to pay more attention to where we put those bracing loads. So they, re, they uh, limit the amount of uh, spacing between framing members to 16 inches. So 
call attention to that if you use a lot of eye joists because we do a lot of uh, efficiency use and sometimes 19.2 ends up being the, the default. So if we're in high seismic and we run into this irregularity, we just need to be able to you know, remember that and pay attention to that uh, requirement. And when you're on the cantilever side, we need to have a minimum of two times that setback, which that usually doesn't come into play, but it's just noted there to make sure that we've got that covered. Third one, where we do have braced wall panels on that uh, cantilever or that overhang or that setback, we need to make sure that we've got a double joist at each end of the braced wall panel. It's not really uh, overly onerous. You see the little splice connection there, or that joint. So on your continuous rim board, if you don't land on a framing member and you've got a joint there, a splice in between there, you've got to put a, a simple little plate there. That's an easy fix, but we just need to make sure we're paying attention to that on the installation side of the world. And number five is the opening. That openings are limited to an eight foot maximum on that header span over an opening. And again, unless you're into some pretty uh, custom or grand size home, homes, that usually doesn't come into play all that much either. So here's a picture of a home that might sort of look like where we've got some um, cantilevers there and, and, and what were those rules might apply. So just a summary of what we need again of those rules. So what would that look like on, on a structure here? If you look at wall number one from the outside wall, we're probably within that four feet. And I, I guess I should mention here too, make sure that when we're talking about that distance of that four feet, um, two things. One, that uh, we're looking at the wall to wall distance, not where the roof overhang goes to. So we're looking at the perimeter of the walls. And then secondly, I, I say four feet, and I think I might have said four times on the on the first slide, but the slide actually tells us that it's four times the depth of the framing member. Up here in Washington State, and most of the areas that I work with um, in the high seismic areas, they generally just use that as a rule of thumb as four feet because we're usually in that ten or eleven inch inch range when we're dealing with the, the depth of a framing number. And so they kind of just use a rule of thumb at four feet. The, the rule actually reads four times the depth, but most people use that rule of thumb. You look at number two back there, that wall is way back. That's not anywhere near, so uh, that's probably 10 plus feet there. So the fix to that is that that, that, that structure would need to have some sort of a braced wall panel underneath, or a braced wall line, rather, underneath number two. Laterally unsupported roofs or floors. Um, again, this doesn't deal with the potential of needing a post for the vertical loads. This deals with that overhang. How far can that overhang deck or roof be from the braced wall? And that's a maximum of six feet. So that six feet, again, that, that is measured at that beam on the outside, not at the roof overhang, because we're looking at the boundary of where the load goes, not where the roof overhang is. So we get a, a maximum of six feet for that. Third irregularity that we talked about, that's the uh, uh, braced wall panel over some sort of an opening below. We're allowed to go up to one foot and still be okay. So the minute we jump into something that looks like this, where the brace wall panel is more than the one foot, then we have some rules again. Those rules, um, again, have that maximum eight foot header. Uh, when we get into, along with that header, we have there, there's kind of two considerations here. We obviously have to look at the floor already and what kind of load that floor put on, or the roof, put on that header or that opening based on the spacing and span of the floor or the roof carrying across the, the dimension of the, of the structure of the house. So we go to that table and we already find out what we need for a header. 
This is an additional step. So we look at the, the opening length, and in this case, we have them in, in three categories, four, six, or eight feet, and it tells us we need to have more and better. We gotta be beefier or we have to be larger. Something that tells us we put more meat under there where we're gonna be dumping some of that load. So we really look at two tables, and whichever of those two tables um, are the more restrictive or is the one that we have to take. <clears throat> also, with that brace wall panel being inside or more than the one foot into the opening, there's uh, the fifth rule that we have to adhere to is that the edge, one edge of the brace wall panel has to be in line with the framing below of that opening to help absorb some of that load. So we can't be fully in or over another six inches where the brace panel is free inside the entire uh, side of that opening without being in line with the framing member below. Fourth one is the uh, uh, that roof or floor opening, typically which is a stairwell opening. We have to look at the least dimension of the length and width, and whichever one that is, divide that by two and we'll get a number. And we take that number, and that tells us how big our opening is, and if that number exceeds 12 feet, then we have to take the 12 feet maximum. So the 12 foot rule or um, half of the distance of, of the least dimension, either one of those would apply. And again, if we're outside and we can't make one of those two work, then we go straight to engineering. There, there aren't additional rules to help us stay within, within the IRC. And that's to prevent stuff like this, where we've got these large openings and big walls up front, no lateral support. So you know they have to draw a line somewhere there to, to uh, make sure that we've got the, the, uh, able to carry the load. Vertical offsets, that's one I said we don't see a ton of that anymore. I happen to live in a 70s home now, and we do have a, a room like this, but um, most of the homes built now, we're not seeing this uh, anymore. Uh, but as things evolve and cycle, who knows, we might see them again. So here we, uh, again, have a couple of rules. The rules are very simple because we're in the high seismic already anyway, so um, we have to deal with a continuous foundation uh, as it is and that framing uh, lap there. The rules for that are very simple and, and at most, again, we might have to put a plate splice there again. So it's a, it's a real easy fix on this one too if we run into it. Sixth one, we're dealing with the non-perpendicular walls. There's just no fix to that. That's, we go straight into engineering. And the last one is that masonry and concrete. So stories above grade include masonry and con in, in concrete construction. We fall into that um, irregular, irregular category, irregularity of the building. And so uh, you can't move forward, but there are some exceptions. So if the structures would build and we have fireplaces and chimneys and our masonry and or stone, is only of veneer, then we can keep moving on, and then there's rules around that for that additional load. So that's the uh, uh, irregular irregularities. <clears throat> I'm just going to quickly remind us again here that from the 06 to now, those of you that have been doing this for a long time, you'll remember that we started with a single table that was pretty much governed by seismic and the wind just kind of rode along with us. Um, Bob showed you the difference between the wind loading where we load one side and uh, um, resist on the two perpendicular walls to that loaded side. The seismic tables we're dealing with the same way we remember it in 06 and prior that uh, the loaded wall is the resisting wall. Along with that, for those of you that ever tried to read some of those uh, definitions of what a brace wall line was in 09, uh, you may have been as confused as the rest of us. So in 12, they drew a picture for us, and now the confusion should be less. I sure hope so. Um, 
So this diagram actually gives us a clear depiction of where a brace wall line starts and stops. So you can see where 1 and A connect there. And because we used the um, imaginary wall line that Bob covered with you, you can see in this, this case uh, the intersection of those two lines is in the middle of nowhere. It's not on a physical line. It's outside the building to some degree. <clears throat> In 09, or the prior codes, that definition of brace wall line length now, in seismic, because we care about length, um, people would spend all day trying to decide whether or not, and I'm going to use the pointer just for a quick second here, so whether or not this brace part of the, of the uh, structure carries over, and does our brace wall line actually need to be this long? Or is it really here, and is our brace line, should it have actually stopped here for deciding how long brace wall line A is? Well, there was a lot of opinion about that in 09, and uh, I think they made it very clear now. So essentially, what they've done is they've kind of allowed an averaging, if you will. So if you looked at this point of the line, and you said, all right, if I went to the brace wall line for seismic table, I need this much bracing. But now my dot's out here. Well, that's not fair. I get cheated, and I have to put more bracing on this brace wall line than I should. Well, if you looked up here for some of the other folks that might have thought we needed to be out here for defining the brace wall line, then the code book would say, well, you're cheating the code book because you're not coming all the way out to the farthest brace, farthest projection of a physical wall line. So essentially, when we clarify this um, uh, uh, imaginary braced wall line and where those red dots intersect, it's pretty easy to see where the spans or spacing is between for when and where the dot ends when we have to decide how long is that braced wall line. So you can see here that in design, which is only half of the puzzle, we have to look at where the dots are to say how long our brace wall line is. So that you might say that's a 30-foot wall line. But in application, now when I have to put my stuff on a wall, I have to find a physical place to stick it now. So when I put that on a wall, I may only have 27, 8, 26 feet or something like that to apply the material that I said was a 30-foot wall. So the designed brace wall line doesn't always match up to the physical wall line in size. And uh, Bob already covered the win. The beauty of splitting those tables is we went from uh, uh, more uh, restrictive spacing between brace wall lines from the 06 code where we had a combined table to the win code or win table in code now where we can go farther. However, us in seismic here, for what we're talking about today, basically the rules haven't changed much. We still have in C townhomes, townhouses, uh, we're allowed to go up to 35 feet, or we can go up to 50 with uh, some factoring or limitations or added added bracing, whatever you want to say. And then anything, whether you're townhome or single family, once we hit D zero and above then that spacing drops down to 25 feet, and then we can go to 35 with a few exceptions or rules, however you want to think of that. One of those is we can accommodate, and this was in the 09 code too, but was confusing to everybody. It's still confusing today. Essentially, we can pick a 900 square foot area out of a structure, and we can use this one time and go to 35 feet with no added penalties or bracing requirements. You get to do it one time, that's it. There's a period then in the code, and then it says, or you can go to 35 feet for any time, essentially, as long as you take the added bracing requirement. So as long as you take that factor, we can go past uh, that one rule of 900 feet one time. We can use 35 feet all day long, any time we want. We just have to keep increasing the amount of bracing we need. And then the second piece of that puzzle was that 3 to 1 aspect ratio in the structure. And honestly, unless uh, unless you're doing some of these narrow urban infill type homes, very, very seldom does that come into play. But 
that is the limit, limiting rule. All right, so locations. I'm not going to do a lot on the locations other than just to, to remind everybody what Bob told us is that we have 10 feet between, uh, I'm sorry, 10 feet from corner to start a first braced panel and 20 feet between inner edges of interior braced wall panels. The reason I'm bringing that up again is that if you were used to or knew seismic design in the 09 and prior, we were only allowed to go to 8 feet from the edge. And so now they've changed that. So the wind folks say, gosh, we got ripped off because we used to be able to go ten, uh, 12 and a half feet from the corners. Now we can only go 10. And us in Seismic said, yay, you know, we got a bonus because we went from 8 feet to 10 feet. So now our openings or whatever it is that we're trying to skip over there from the corner have moved up from 8 feet to 10 feet. And so that was, a, that was a benefit or a bonus for us. Location of the brace wall panels. Uh, I'm just going to show you this uh, when we get in D, uh, where we can go up to 10 feet. So there are uh, the same rules that Bob showed you. We either have to have some sort of uh, wood material, sheathing material in the corner. May or may not meet bracing requirements as long as it's two feet uh, on each side of that corner. We can call it our corner detail and we're good to go. And we can move that first piece of bracing, as you see in the diagram on the left there, 10 feet over. <clears throat> if we don't have room for that bracing in the corner, we can still go that 10 feet over, but we need to go 18, um, I'm sorry, we need to put a hold down that's an 1,800 pound hold down now. So in wind, Bob probably told you that's an 800 pound hold down. So those of you in wind, close your ears if you're not going to design seismic. If you are going to design seismic, that hold down requirement bumps up from 8 to 1,800 pounds. That's important because uh, we're getting into more of a traditional type hold down, even though it's a lighter weight one. Uh, we're getting to a more traditional one. The method BV is what you see in the bottom, brick veneer. It's been around sporadically through code, but it's been condensed into the 12 code. And so there's some details around method BV or brick veneer that are also helpful for us, but we're not going to get into a lot of detail with that today. I'll show you the, the, the method here in a minute, though. The lengths, uh, again, what do we do, do with lengths, both wind and seismic? There's things we have to look at and uh, consider and to get into how much length we're going to need. As I said before, those tables are broken apart now. The base table for wind is three parentheses one. The seismic table is three parentheses three. And then the two factor tables, which used to be in footnotes for each of those, wind respectively is parentheses two and seismic is parentheses four, which uh, uh, deal with all of the factors then that we have to add on top of this base table. You saw something similar to this with Bob. Uh, this is now seismic. So that base table on the left has some boundaries or perimeters we work with as far as soil class, wall height, weight per dead load for the floor and roof ceiling and for uh, spacing of braced wall lines. If we fall out of any of those, then we jump into the factors and we have some considerations for those on the right. <clears throat> required bracing length for story height might change based on a factor. Brace wall line spacing might change uh, based on a factor. Dead load, all of those things, masonry veneer, the interior gypsum on the inside, the stuff that we put inside our walls. Cripple walls aren't necessarily right on that, that table with factors, but I wanted to stick it in here only because there are some significant uh, factors that would uh, increase the amount of bracing needed when we get into cripple walls when we're dealing with seismic. So panel materials, the BV, I, I mentioned that earlier, so when we get into D and above um, and we're using brick veneer, uh, there are some requirements that we may need to consider um, with the brick veneer. The only real change with that where they brought it out of the table uh, in 09 is that they had it uh, developed in percentages still in 09. 
they changed it to feet. The value didn't change, or I mean, the amount didn't change. They just uh, changed it to uh, feet to be more consistent with what's in the chapter. Method ABW, you've already shown this, so I'm not going to get into details of the system itself, but uh, just remember that ABW is one of those that's seismically limited to 10 feet when you're in C for townhomes or D and above um, for any structure. That mixing and matching, again, remember uh, Bob went through all of the mixing methods with you, but I just want to reiterate because where I'm at up here, um, a lot of the designers really uh, chomp at the bit to try to figure out a way where they can still use uh, method GB on the interiors of uh, wall lines uh, when we're in high seismic using continuously sheathed, and we just can't do it. There's you know, practically, maybe there's some common sense there, but the code basically just says, no, we can't do that. So I just want to remind us that we can't do it. Oops, I'm sorry. This is that stuff again that Bob went through. So this is not method GB, which is a bracing method. This is the stuff. you got to have something on the inside of all of our braced wall panels, or the majority of our braced wall panels, with those exceptions that you can read there. Um, that stuff has to be in there. If it's not, if you remember, Bob probably told you that you have to take a 1.4 factor. Well, in seismic, that factor is actually 1.5. So uh, you might want to remember the two of those factors, 1.4 and 1.5. And here's a you know, close-up of what I already showed you before with that 1,800-pound hole down. Don't need to worry about that. Okay, splices. Uh, the folks I work with up here a lot, I know they're familiar with this splice. I have had some people uh, in presentations look at me with that I didn't know that look. So uh, just know that we're in the high seismic categories that at the top plate splices we're required to use eight 16D nails on each side of that splice. Don't confuse that, though, with the engineered collector. I, I did want to bring that up. Uh, I don't know if Bob did or not, so I can't recall. APA's got a technical report, or a TT-102 technical topics, what we call that, TT-102. Essentially, we give you some prescribed answers and the formulas to where you can design or, or use this collector uh, based on Chapter 3 of the code, where we can use an alternate means or method. And, and this is also uh, prescribed or shown in the uh, bracing book, to the, the commentary bracing book. So what this is for is if you have an opening or something that was more than that 10 feet away from the corner and want to still try to find a way to stay in prescriptive construction, we can move to uh, this TT-102 and use this as a solution. The rafter connection, uh, basically when we get into the D, and uh, you probably saw this because it, it has a, a wind speed uh, uh, maximum attached to it also. So we get high winds or the high seismic D and above, um, we need to make sure that it, uh, we have that block in place for any distances that are up to 15 and a quarter inches from the top plate to the bottom of the sheathing. And then there's details for the raised energy heel trusses and things like that that Bob showed you. But just want to remind each other, all of us, that um, we can't forego that block. It's required. <clears throat> Foundations. Um, Everybody understands foundations. We want to stick this uh, stuff in the ground so that it'll keep the house in place and hopefully it won't squash down and allow some sort of overturning. Call that a footing and a foundation. And uh, if we do all that right and then do what we're supposed to do on the structure, then uh, things work out for us. There's a few requirements in the, in the uh, high seismic zones where we do have to pay attention to what we put in uh, those uh, um, footings and foundations. And so 
whether it's single pour or double pour, there's still the requirement. Um, we end up having to put um, number four bars at the top and the bottom, whether that's the interior brace wall line or the perimeter. If we do do a double pour where we have that construction or cold joint, then we have to put uh, another hook number four uh, bars at four feet on center. And the same thing goes for um, seismic when we have stem walls that are above that 12 inch uh, maximum that we're allowed to have. And then when we uh, uh, move into a stem wall, then there's requirements there too for what we need to do on that uh, hooked vertical bar. Also, uh, the ABW and portal frame, remember those have the uh, portal frame with hold downs, I should say. Both of those have the large hold downs embedded into the concrete, so we need some reinforcement there with those bars. The stem walls, uh, this was another good addition. Um, they brought that into the Chapter 6, too. Basically, there's not, you don't see a lot of difference between the concrete and the CMU stem walls, but I wanted to make note that there's uh, you know, some very specific prescriptions on what we have to do to uh, hold those stem walls down. If you are going to use an ABW, alternate braced wall, or the PFH portal frame with hold downs, the one thing to remember is that we can only do that with a poured and placed concrete stem wall. We can't use those with the CMU walls. Bracing foundations, uh, and the um, spacing of the foundations. So in seismic design category D2, only D2, not D1, nothing below D1. When we're in D2, first story only, or a single story rather, <clears throat> we need to have um, footings spaced at 50 foot interval. Now if you went back to chapter 4 and looked at the footing spacing anyway, there's a little bit of conflict, so we'd be at 50 feet anyway, but um, they do call attention to this uh, for this D2 for uh, continuous footings at 50 feet. And then when you go to D2 two-story, we're told that we need to have uh, continuous at all interior braced wall lines. Obviously, it's a given that the perimeter already has continuous, so it's not shown there, but uh, because it's a given. So all interior braced wall lines, then, if it's a two-story, would have to have continuous foundations uh, underneath those braced wall lines. Well, as we've already seen in a lot of these other rules, there are these three exceptions or rules to the exception that we can get around and honestly these aren't that bad either so you could actually get to back to that 50 foot interval on a two story as long as the cripple walls are not more than four feet and uh, the first floor uh, brace wall panels are supported by something usually a double joist or blocking or a floor beam or something and the distance between the brace wall lines, they don't exceed twice the distance of that parallel brace wall line, that measurement, the width of that measurement. So the, um, the rules really, that one doesn't really come into play too much again. So uh, it's not that hard to uh, meet the rules to allow you to keep that 50-foot spacing on D2. So, Essentially, if you don't do these rules, you're stuck with it. You have to put continuous under every single one of your brace wall panels on the interior brace wall lines. If you can make these uh, uh, subset rules, if you can make them work, then uh, we can get back to that 50 foot interval. Cripple walls. Um, we all know what a cripple wall is. Usually it's there to, you know, like on a steps foundation or somewhere where we want to um, uh, keep the floor level. They added a couple little clarifications or changes on the cripple walls. Used to be there was 20 feet between braced wall panels on the cripple walls and that's uh, now uh, taken down to 14 feet and they defined the cripple wall as uh, uh, not exceeding 48 inches and otherwise we would redesignate. And so what does that look like then? Essentially for cripple walls uh, if we keep it called a cripple wall, we have uh, um, 
the first floor where we just deal with it normal. It's just a regular first floor, do all the factors, get all of those in to where we have a final answer. And then for the cripple wall, we just uh, increase it by a factor of 1.15. We can redesignate if we want. We can call that two stories. So that one story with what looks to be a uh, crawl space now ends up being a two story in design, an unusable two story. But in design, to get bracing, it ends up being a two story. So you look at the first, first story, top of two, and you look at the second story, bottom of two, and we just do the design as normal. Um, and also note that the uh, spacing between brace panel edges goes back out to 20 feet also. So that was with D up to D1. D2, in this case, with one story, we do the exact same thing. D1 again, now if we have a two-story, we can keep it a cripple wall. So we have a two-story with cripple wall, same thing. The floor above ends up being the bottom of two. Uh, include all the factors. We get a number, multiply it times 1.15, and we can stay as a cripple wall and move on. If we want to redesignate, we can. Uh, we end up with a three-story then, so A1 to A to D1, excuse me, we can go from uh, up to a three-story and redesignate that, and then you treat them all as individual stories, even though it's a two-story usable house, but a three-story in design. Um, that would be the limit, though. When we get to D2, if you go to the tables, we don't. there's nothing there that allows us numbers. It's just not possible, so we can't... Uh, design a true redesignated three-story. In 09, we couldn't even do a two-story with cripple wall. So another good addition to the 12 code is that they now put a uh, row down there at the bottom of the, uh, the seismic tables for D2 to where we can have a two-story and a true cripple wall underneath, and they just give us a prescribed number uh, for the amount of bracing that we need for our cripple walls, too. Um, that interior brace wall line, so in this case B, where we're in D0 and D1, um, you have a choice. So you're supposed to or you need to put a, uh, use that continuous bracing under uh, wall line B also in your cripple wall. If you don't use brace wall line B, then the rule says you're okay as long as you're still able to put 1.5 or an increased amount of bracing between A and C. So you have the 1.15 already because you just called it a cripple wall. Now if you want to say, oh, I've got a, um, uh, not, I don't want to use that interior brace wall line B, then I can do that. But now I have to add another 1.5 on top of that. So it gets pretty, uh, pretty heavy as far as the amount of bracing is going to be required. Bob might have showed this already. I kind of like this in the seismic uh, uh, talks because you, know, you could spend 15 minutes trying to decide whether this is a one-story, two-story crawl space, what's here, you know, who cares what we call that. It's, a, it's an ugly duckling. So if you notice all those openings in the critical area, uh, it's got CMU block. I sure hope that that's reinforced. Uh, um, anyway, it's a it's a neat picture for a conversation. Also, we can't stack. We have to have continuous studs. Uh, we have to use the three inch uh, plate washers there now. So, uh, um, if we do use slotted, though, we we have the additional uh, traditional washer that goes on top of the slotted before the nut. Also, okay, so. Uh, I wanted to take a quick, quick look at a design if we have time. I'm going to see what we're going to do here in just a minute, but I'm going to go through some just some uh, visual before I stop, and then uh, depending on what the questions are, we may or may not jump into another uh, design on the calculator, but Bob did a very comprehensive um, uh, display of the calculator, so we'll see how that works. Um, in 09, we were told that we needed to start putting designations. What are you using for bracing? Where's your bracing located? Prove to me that you have enough bracing. 
all noted on the plans. So uh, we're not trying to tell you what to do in this uh, slide, but just to kind of remind everybody that uh, we want to start using uh, some sort of symbology to where we can uh, readily identify what's on the plan. <clears throat> this structure is going to be a seismic D1 and also high wind in this case, exposure B. But I wanted to quickly just kind of go through how we deal with that. No really difference here than uh, what we do for wind, other than there are some issues in the seismic tables that you know, we, we deal with that we've already covered. So this is a you know pretty basic 2,700 plus square foot. We've got um, like I said, 105 miles per hour in a D1 category. So what are we going to do? We need to identify the wind and seismic. We need to do both. Check for any irregularities. That's a go or no go. Is the mean rough height 30 feet or less? Another go or no go. We need to decide if the bracing, uh, what bracing method we want to use on each story. And that's usually kind of a quick check. Um, of what, what we can do or not do, and then if you wanted to mix something, remember there's a lot of mixing rules there that we're not allowed to do when we're doing continuously cheap. Um, and then kind of a review where the panel size and location are going to be, uh, and then start marking those on the set of plans. We use kind of a numbered lettered uh, sequence in our calculator or in our examples. <coughs> and then measure the spacing. So we've got wind uh, categories we went through. We've got all those seismic categories that we went through. You notice there's an asterisk on a number of these. But what that does is tell us that uh, um, we can interpolate when we want to, or need to, rather. And then we need to look at those irregularities. We do happen to have, if you look at the uh, top left and the bottom, uh, uh, pictures here or, or, or depictions of the, of the structure. We've got some bump outs and setbacks and we've got that uh, porch in the front where we've got that roof hanging out. And so we've got uh, also um, brace wall panels that could fall on top of um, uh, an opening below. So quick check again with our rough mean height, it's under 30 feet, we're good to go. We're going to say we had 9 foot uh, eave ridge, 8 foot top story, 9 foot lower story. And we're going to take a quick look at that then from plan view and start drawing in where we have available space. So we're on the first story here and we, we kind of in these uh, tan or mustardy color start writing or drawing down where we think uh, we can put braced panels at and we start looking at then where would our braced wall lines be and from that we can see we start putting in spacing between braced wall lines. Here's the second story. Now notice uh, you'll see around the perimeter there there's these uh, blue boxes with question marks. That's just kind of a a note for me, what you guys do or how you do it really doesn't matter, but um, somehow you need to uh, rec excuse me, recognize where the uh, openings will be on the braced, potential braced wall panel locations. So the opening below the braced wall panel above. And so those kind of note where the, if we went back, where those openings are, you can see where these openings are and how they uh, coincide with where the uh, question mark is, just so we can remember to pay attention to that if it's going to matter at the end of the day. And so if we were going to do this longhand, um, we need to look at all of these factors and start deciding what our factors are for the brace wall lines. And in this case, the, uh, seismically, we got a 1.24 factor on the letter brace wall lines mostly because, remember, we had 25 feet as our maximum we can go uh, for spacing between brace wall lines. In this case, we went to 31, and we just took the factor there, or the penalty, if you will. Uh, wind, we're not going to go through. And then seismic again. In the uh, uh, second story, lettered again, we went slightly over 25 feet. That was the 
what really took us over the 1.0. So we have just a little bit of a increase um, uh, over the uh, uh, 1.0 factor. I have to go through wind again. So if we were to look at the tables, we go to D1 and pick a spacing. We're just going to do one here. So we would pick a spacing and say, all right, I'm between 30 and 40 feet. I can try to use the number and see if it's okay without spending the time to interpolate. May or may not work, or I can just interpolate. The beauty of the calculator that Bob showed you is that all of that's done for you. You just put the pure number in and we get an answer. So we look at all those wall lines and this is somewhat interesting here. So I, I chose a large, uh, I said that it was 105 mile an hour wind, so we had to use the 110 table, um, less than 110, I should say. So if you look at that table, uh, there are times where wind dictates how much bracing we have. So wall line A, we need 16.68 feet, and D1 says we need 15.2. And then you could go farther down and see maybe like on wall line two, we only need 11.12 feet on wind, but we need 19.48 on seismic. So here's where if you believe that the codes are better and more accurate, you can see that in action going from wind to seismic, whereas before we just had a seismic table and wind sort of came along for the ride. So you can see where it, it does apply when you get into higher winds, where one wall may be seismically controlled, the other one might be wind controlled. Second story, same thing. <clears throat> we go to the tables again, get a number, and then if we want to interpolate, we can. You may not need to, so you may not spend time. If you're, if you're, this is all if you're going to still do it longhand. As I said again, the calculator, the beauty of that is that um, it does that all for you. And then um, we need to know openings at some point because we can we chose continuously sheathed, and so we'd have to know bracing size and openings. And if you start looking, I, I, I'm probably not telling you anything new that openings sort of. Uh, are, are uh, consistent or uniform. We don't have a lot of two foot, then three foot, then four foot, then two foot windows. A lot of times you can go to just the tallest window, get an answer, and then you'll know, uh, depending on your segment size, that many times you don't really even have to go back and verify because you know it's going to work. But to do that, we would start looking at these braced wall lines individually. And we'd say, all right, I have opening sizes and I had braced wall panels noted. And I'd have to individually just keep going through all of these braced wall lines and verify that um, uh, my braced wall panel qualifies because that's the next step. We have to find out how much we need. Then we go and we look at the placement rules and say, all right, now I need to start sticking these things in place and make sure that they're qualified or not. So each time you do that, you'd have to look at an opening, and then you'd have to look at um, the bracing next to it, check the table, and see whether you, your uh, bracing is enough, uh, the segment size is qualified to be counted as bracing or not. Again, the beauty of that is that we would look at, uh, at the calculator that Bob showed you, and that would do, uh, do it all for you. So. I would just be, I'm just continuing to repeat myself to go through these. Um, and I think because of time, uh, I should stop and I'll repeat here again that who I am and here's my contact and that uh, Brian will be coming up next. But um, Steve, if you want to try to make this work. Thanks, Roger. Um, because we have issues with the um, echoing with Roger's speakers, I'd appreciate it if everyone would just type in their questions. I realize we're about 11 minutes over already, and I appreciate everybody hanging in there because this has been awesome information that you've given us, Roger. And we do have a couple questions 
that have been uh, coming in while you've been talking. The first one relates back to when you were describing or showing the illustration of the brace walls being able to be 10 foot back from the corners. And Bernice writes in, I thought it was 12 foot 6 combined on each corner. Did this change to 10 feet on each side? Unmuted. Hey, you're doing well with that. Thanks, Bernice. That's, yes. Uh, so the distinction there is that in 2009, you were exactly right. It was 12 and a half feet. And depending on what method you used, that was the limit 12 and a half, or you actually could do 12 and a half on both sides if uh, you were using a continuously sheathed method. Um, so essentially you had 25 feet to play with to, to be no more than 12 and a half on either side. Uh, the change in the 12 code is that they tried to simplify it. What happened is they simplified the uh, confusion of the distance between braced wall panels on the interior part of that line. So it used to be, it, we used to say rule of thumb is you'd throw one on every corner and one every 25 feet. That 25 foot meant from the center of the brace panel to the center of the brace panel. Well, all brace panels aren't equal anymore. They're not the same size. So the folks in the in the ad hoc committee said, let's just get this simplified. That really that edge to edge is 21 feet. So if uh, because of different size panels, they settled on 20 feet being an easy one to remember. So they just said, look, if we're going to do 20 feet edge to edge now on those interior ones, let's just change it to 10 feet for distance from the corner. The 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 I guess the rub for that is what Bernice brought up, is that if she's in wind categories, she's used to be able to go 12 and a half feet. That was good. When they went to 10 feet, the wind folks would say, well, this is a bummer because we used to be able to go 12 and a half feet. Now we're stuck at 10. The seismic folks were always stuck at 8 feet. So when it went to 10 feet, the seismic folks kind of said, hooray, you know, that's a good thing because now we can go to eight, uh, 10 feet instead of 8. So wind guys lost 2 feet, seismic guys gained 2 feet. Thanks, Roger. Uh, the next two questions that I have both come in from Ron. He says, do you have any pictures of horizontal collector strapping above windows, and how far off can you be when doing a vertical collector strap, parentheses CS? at the top story from the bottom story to tie the two stories together. And then his second question is, what is a good website for pictures of collector strapping, and how is it shown on the plans and pictures of the strapping, how, uh, of the strapping on homes? Unmuted. Thank you for that. Um, we, APA, uh, doesn't have much for you as far as, um, uh, I, I guess, I, I'm, I'm guessing what you're really hoping for is a CAD detail to be able to use on your plans. What we have is um, our, 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 our guide named Combined Shear and Uplift um, deals with that. So essentially, uh, I guess I can say this is a proprietary thing, that our guys shall, our our members sell wood, so we've come up with solutions, and they honestly are very good solutions and inexpensive solutions to where you can use structural panels to be that bridge that you're looking for from floor to floor, and, uh, and, and it's called combined shear and uplift because it deals with both of those things when you get into the high wind it, uh, uh, areas of the country, so it will work and we have details for that, uh, but uh, any of the manufacturers that are, are making the uh, metal products that would be the other option, one of their websites, I'm sure they, I, I know um, that I've been to their websites and they have good details, pictures for download or diagrams for you to be able to use on your plans. Roger, when Ron talks about uh, how is it shown on the plans, uh, I've seen where people have not only provided 
brace wall plans, but then had like reduced eighth inch size exterior elevations that were just the outline of the building and the openings with the locations of the brace walls shown with high uh, hatching. Would that be a good place to show this kind of col uh, collector strapping and then refer to the details? Oh, I'm muted. Yeah, Steve, you're exactly right. Of 90% of what I would consider good plans, um, they do just what you said. That uh, uh, they'll have a they'll have a specific uh, uh, call out sheet for showing brace panels, and they will usually use a symbol of some sort. They're not all the same, like a V or an X or something. Uh, and there might be a couple of them because uh, they'll, they'll have different sized hold downs or or a, a metal strap of some sort. So usually they'll have just a symbol in the location on that same uh, uh, call out drawing where they do the brace panels, and then they'll have a, a cut or a, what you're saying a detailed sheet in the back where uh, they'll show a, a depiction of that connector, whatever it is. Thanks, Roger. And that's all the questions I've got. And I appreciate everybody joining us today. Uh, Roger, could you tell us again or maybe show us where these recordings of the prior three episodes have been stored and where everybody can get to uh, them as well as this one next week once we get it posted? Unmuted. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, because uh, I've shown my uh, ignorance on. Uh, this online thing, <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm fearful that, uh, can you see that? No, no, that's wrong now, sorry. APA's website, it's uh, perform on, on the uh, slide you see right now, performancewalls.org. On the left margin, um, there will be a link to the to the uh, wall bracing webinars, and you click on that link, and then there will be a page that shows all. At some point, all five will show up there. And uh, uh, if I was uh, swift enough to be able to get my second monitor to work, uh, I could show you it. But that's that's killing me today. So I'm. Very that's no problem, Roger. It sounds simple enough. You go to www.performancewalls.org, and in the left-hand margin, you just look for the tab that says uh, webinars. I appreciate everybody's time today. Without having an audience, we wouldn't have had a presentation to give to anyone. And uh, Roger, thank you very much for taking your time and sharing the information with us. Uh, Bob Clark from the APA, who helped us put these series together. Our next webinar is October 16th, 3 o'clock Eastern Time, and uh, go to AIBDmember.org, and in the right-hand margin will be a link to register for the October 16th. Thank you.